Good morning, Church. What a privilege to come here after such a long time. This is our God, very mysterious, you know. It takes a long way, but it's all His timing. I will let uh, my wife afterwards to give you a bit of background how we end up in your church so that you can see the hands of God that loves you all so much and then you have such a wonderful faithful pastor that want to give you the encouragement and the hope from the Lord our Lord Jesus as usual in all my sharing in a number of country I always start with the ladies first so I'll pass it on to my wife, Ashley, and she will speak first. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, church. Yeah, yesterday we had a warm-up session here, um, just to share our testimony. As you can hear from Pastor Mary, was explaining how our dear late brother, uh, Pastor Clement Wong, he has, start, he has started texting me 2016. And that time, we scheduled November 216 to share at your church, 216. Then along the way, as because I was, oh, I was working full-time at the bank, I kind of missed messages here and there. And I must apologize in, in here to all the churches, because if not, we would have been here 216. But everything is in God's timing, yeah, because God sees our heart. We're trying to, because we only have certain weekends and we've been invited by churches and I'm full-time, but um, my husband is full-time for God. I'm kind of full-time in the bank weekend for God, but from this year onwards, I'm full-time for God also. So, um, come back to the story. Yeah, I think Angeline, if you can give the little chat group I have with um, Pastor Clement Wong. He got our number through a friend. And after hearing our testimony in the YouTube, he texted me 2016. And I told him, yes, we will. But somehow along the way, as you can see, the date October the 5th, and then somehow we were back in Melbourne. We rescheduled the 27th November, supposed to be here to speak. Then I said, why wouldn't we do it 2017? So Pastor Clement was very patient. Okay, lock in 2017. But when 2017 came, he also reminded me and um, texted me. Then I, and then I have another group from Ipo approach me, FGB Ipo. They want to do a big one. I said, I only have one weekend. Why don't you all do together and coordinate? So I left it at that. But somehow that message dropped out, kind of like from my memory, thinking that they would contact me. So from that time to 2019, there's a big gap. And somehow I miss. Um, Pastor Clement messages. Then 2019, Pastor Clement still persistently texts me again. Dear Ashley, I'm Pastor, I'm Pastor Clement Wong from Ipo. My invitation to you long ago still stand. When can you come? Right? And somehow that message, then when I read that, I say, sorry, Pastor, the FGB will contact you. So I gave Pastor Clement, uh, Pastor to FGB. So somehow, I don't know why and what happened. Never happened. Then the next message is 2022. And that is where you see God's hand. And I totally forgot about this message Pastor Clement text to me. And I came back to Singapore. My husband was in Singapore. We always catch up with Pastor Terry Wong. I didn't know Pastor Terry Wong is a brother of Pastor Clement. So that night, we already prior commitment have dinner with Pastor Terry Wong in Singapore. Along on the way to the restaurant, Pastor Terry Wong said, uh, Ashley, my brother happened to be here in Singapore from Ipoh. Can, can he and his wife uh, join us for dinner? And here I am saying, of course, the more the merrier the pastor, right? So I said, of course. And then he mentioned, oh, Pastor Clement Wong. Then on the way in the car, I said, hey, that name sounds a little bit familiar. Where did I heard this name from? So I went to my WhatsApp and looked for Pastor Clement Wong. I said, oh no, what happened? 219, I did not have an answer him, right? 
wow, when I went to the restaurant, they always sit down. And I'm sure Pastor Mary can remember. I was like so apologetic. I said, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I don't know how I miss your messages. I will lock in the date right now. You know, I actually said, then he said, December, Christmas, can you come? I said, okay, 17 December. Because Christmas Eve, I have a wedding dinner. I said, 17 December, I'll lock in. That was in May 2022. I lock it in. And then, of course, two months later, Pastor Terry texted me a shock news saying that Pastor Clement Wong had passed away. And then I was shocked. I was very sad. But the Lord reflected in my heart, saying that, you know, whatever in our heart desire, to him is he has been pursuing six years for this testimony, God's story. It's not about Tony and Ashley. It is God's story who returned by his blood through our lives. And Pastor Clement wanted to bring this story to come here to encourage you all, his church children. And, and yet God grants his wishes. Even before he passing on, God orchestrated everything in his time. Both of us, Pastor Derry didn't know I know Pastor Clement. I didn't know Pastor Clement. It was just through the chat, right? And Pastor Clement also didn't know Pastor Terry having dinner with us. So when at that dinner, you know how God's hand, you know why that dinner happened because God knows this, this lady always forget, always running ahead of everything. I'm, I, must, I must confess, I'm, I'm like kind of multitasking a lot of things, but the Lord knows my heart. It's not that I kind of drop past, uh, Church of Praise out. It was sin sincerely my bad that sometimes when you cope too many things in your hand, things just fall through the crack. I like to apologize for that, but also at the same time, I believe God has his divine timing in his timing for everything. So that's why we are here. Of course, after he passing on, then we are not sure whether it's on or off. So we will pray. I say, Lord, if it is really your will for us to continue. Then later on, about two months ago, Pastor Mary texted me. He got the number from Pastor Terry and said, we still want you to come. So we really want to deliver this message really for our late Pastor Clement, who has been pursuing this story for God. And it is fulfilled today because he really wants the church to hear this amazing story. So before I share this story, I just want to say um, a quick prayer. Because I believe prayer is the one that brought my husband from dead to alive. And for those that who has lived, uh, read the little flyer, practically my husband died as a Buddhist and woke up as a Christian. So before I go into sharing, I just quickly want to pray because I believe the power of praying. It was the power of prayers that brought my husband dead to a life. So today, as you hear the worship leader, as you hear Brother Joseph said, Christmas is not about presents. I remember my young days. I love Christmas. I love going to Christmas tree and look at which is my present. I got very excited. But today, now that I know God, God already given us the best pre present, His ultimate gift of love, which is wrapped in that baby Jesus when He was given to us. He was born on earth to be alive and to suffer through everything, to be kneeled on that cross so that we have eternal life. So now that I have this ultimate gift from God that sacrifices one and only Son, all this presence wrapped in glittering boxes doesn't excite me anymore. And this is how God can transform our life when you actually tasted His goodness. Let us pray. Dear Father God, today I know is a very special moment for this church. As you know that, Lord, we are always running around, so busy for so many things. But God, you are the one who blesses with our day and number of days in our life. And yet sometimes we just keep running around doing a lot of business in our life and just give the little uh, change, coin change to you. But Lord, today as we stand here, we just want to ask the Lord that you come, come upon every one of this here today and fill their hearts, open their hearts and hear your story, the story you personally written with your blood through our lives, into our lives. And today, as we share, Lord, I also pray that your anointing, 
that you touch my lips and my mouth, our mouthpiece, my husband and myself. As we speak, Lord, you will anoint every word that comes from you. We are just the instrument, the ambassador you have chosen to speak for you. Because it is you that we have life. It is you that Tony is now walking and resurrected from dead to alive to be able to share your story. So Lord, I pray that you will open the hearts of the people here. Open their ears, open their eyes. Let them see the things you see in your world, your kingdom of God's world. Not in the world we lived in, when we so sway by the world, we're so attracted to the, the worldly thing. But and yet, Lord, when we found you, we don't need everything in the world. We live in the world, but of the world. But because Jesus, because Jesus, you are with us, you are already in our heart, in our tablet. May your words, may your story be engraved, everyone today. As they leave this sanctuary, Lord, they will bring along your ultimate gift of love. That is your blood of Jesus that you have died on that cross and you give us eternal life. Lord, may you anoint all of us. May you prepare their hearts and ears to hear your amazing and awesome story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. I know I'm giving one hour between my husband and myself. And I try to limit to 20 minutes as I have taken five minutes to explain how I end up there, here. Just want to give a bit of background um, of, our, of my life. I brought up by a very staunch Taoist family. My mother has master, has feng shui master. Every year, especially Chinese New Year, we have a master to dictate our life a year ahead. What the things to do, what the things not to do, and what the things to avoid. So when you're young, you're brought up in such family. All you know is when you're sick, you don't go to doctor. My mom will bring us to temple and come home with a talisman. And she would just burn the talisman. I would just drink the charcoal paper, not knowing what. And that's our medicine. And we get well. So when you are brought up with family like that, you would think that is your medicine. You would think that is the power of God. So... This is what we call idolatry. I was brought up all the way, obviously 1998, 24 years ago, when my husband was diagnosed with cancer. The first thing I did is to tell my mother. Of course, my mother, the first thing, she'll call the master all the way to Penang and tell, because he's very famous. And every, my mother has followed him for 20 or 30 years. So my mother gave him my husband's date of birth straight away. He said, oh, this year, your son-in-law has um, Zhuan Ge Yun because he's 39. According to his date of birth, he has too much element of metal, water, fire, I don't know, there's so many elements. So he mentioned metal. Then he said, because the doctor will give him radiotherapy, and radiotherapy is fire. So he said, he cannot be treated with radiotherapy because he would die from it. He'd go in, radiotherapy, he would not come out alive. So this fear that created in my heart, I would do anything to stop my husband from getting, going to the hospital to get treated by um, radiotherapy. Obviously, I was blinded. I was I mean, living in superstition as well, because we are brought up to believe these are the real thing. So I delayed. And I just, the master gave my mother a stack of talisman. Every day I just burned 10 talisman. And every day my husband asked me the same question. Why am I drinking jacko paper? I say, don't ask, just drink. Because my mother said, uh, it will heal you. And of course, I, I have a very obedient husband. He would just drink. And um, after three months, obviously, it didn't work. The cancer spread from the little dot in the nose to the limb nodes on the neck. So his neck keep growing so big, it's like Dai Gang Bao, you know. So, and um, I'm still so blinded, so superstition because I believe what my mother told me. And I continue giving him the talisman until my husband start bleeding. Every morning wake up, the pillow is filled with blood. 
And I told my mom, I think I cannot, I have to bring him to hospital. And he's having a lot of pain. My mother said, no, you must believe this master. Then my mother came back, the master gave my mother a bottle of wine, or rice wine, soaked with scorpion. Scorpion is one of those like yidogongdu, is like equivalent to chemo. Asked me to feed my husband every night, one teaspoon. So I did that, I wrapped the bottle with tissue, with cloth, not to show him the scorpion, probably he won't drink. So I kind of like, every night just give him this, say wine will cure you. So he drank another three months. Obviously, it didn't work. And after that, I told my mom, I really have to bring Tony. And he started having pain at the back. And I didn't know why. Actually, the cancer has spread to the bone. Then I asked my mom, I really have to bring him to the hospital. My mother said, you mean you didn't hear what the Sufu said? Ah? The Sufu said, if you bring him to the hospital, he will die in the hospital. You must try everything the Sufu said. He's very jun, he's very powerful, he's very, you know, all the things. So I said, okay, okay. You know, when you're brought up in such family, you just kind of, not that you don't choose to think, you're just blinded. You're so, I was so desperate. Anything that you give me, I will try. So ultimately, the master told my mother, looks like Tony needs an ultimate um, solution. Ask your daughter to put 99 joystick and kneel down and pray to Heavenly God and Tian Shen. You know, in the Chinese, they have the Tian Shen. And ask the Tian Shen to give thunderstorm and the lightning strike and he only can be cured by the lightning strike. So, can you believe what I do? I was every night praying, please let the thunderstorm come. And one day it came, and I quickly pushed my husband up in the swing, which is made of metal. So I said, surely he can be struck by lightning, sitting on the metal swing. So he sat there for th three hours. Wow, it was really thunder, it was really striking. But somehow he didn't get struck. Then he was so cold after two, three hours. <laughs> they said, Lo Paul, can I come in? I'm like shivering. So I said, okay, okay, come back in, right? Because he said, if not, I will have pneumonia. So we came back in. Then I told my mother, we tried, but he didn't get striped. So my mother said, wait another two days or three days. You come to my house. Your, your house is only level ground. Come to my house, third floor, up in the roof. Then you sit there in the pitch of the rooftop. Surely he will get striped. So I said, okay, I'll wait one more week. And after that, if he doesn't get striped, I have to send him to hospital. So that day came. Wow, the thunder was really, really, very strong and the lightning was very strong. I drove all the way to my mother's house, climbed up all to the rooftop stairs, rooftop, and then the pitch, I put my husband, sit at the pitch of the roof. Third story, huh? very high, huh? surely get strike one, cannot jaw one like this one. So he quite, quite sit on the pitch of the rooftop and me and my, my mother was carrying an umbrella, waiting and waiting. I was praying, Tian Sun, Tian Sun, quite think Ah, oh, thunder strike. And the thunder came, the lightning came, but he did, still didn't get strike. Then I said, oh, how to speed it up? Ma? If not, after what he said, he's cold, pneumonia, want to come down. So I thought, being an engineer, we thought we are clever. Huh? So I said, Lokung, look at the TV antenna next to the rooftop. Can you put your hand on the TV antenna? Because the antenna is very long, you know, very tall. So sure, one, this one cannot jump one. Ah. And then he hold on to the thing. Oh, then when the lightning strike come, I said, Mom, surely this one can make it all. So my mom said, Ah, ding la, you know, come go. You know, and they golf, uh, take a golf stick on the ground, you also get strike, right? Iron strike. Ah, yeah, third story with the thing going up to four story, sure. But the lightning strike came. And yet, God preserved him. I you know those days, those years, too, that was 1998, 24 years ago, we didn't know God. And God is so amazing. God already chosen us, both of us. He's looking up there. He was the one who preserved my husband's life, right? Because every life given by God. So God preserved his life for what? So that today we can share this testimony. It may sound ridiculous on me, but, a little, but God used a foolish thing to shame the wise. We thought we are very clever, right? But God has other plans. So he didn't get striked. Then I said, oh, no, you know. So he came down. Then I brought him to Singapore. I told my mom, that's it. I have to bring him to Singapore. So we drove all the way from KL to Singapore. First thing the doctor would do is take scan. 
MRI scan, blood test and everything. And then our son then was nine months old. As we were in the clinic, our son was crawling in the clinic, and then the doctor looked at the scan and looked at us and paused for a while and stared at us and said, what took you guys so long? Because when he see the, the extent of the cancer cell grow from the nose to the, wow, the, the neck was so big, right? How can you take such pain, right? And then eight parts of the bone all eaten by the cancer. About 0 0.1, 1, 0.01 mm, my husband will be paralyzed. He was, the, the cancer was eating the main bone into the nerves, almost touching the nerves, right? So he said, I don't know what to do. It's too late now. Maybe you have three more months to live. You just go and enjoy your life with your son. Go and travel. Go and, because whatever chemo I'm giving you, you will die faster because you'll die from the chemo than the cancer. So that time, my husband got the news from the doctor. They looked at our son, Leonard. They said, doctor, I just have one wish. Then doctor said, what? I just want to see my son walking. Because that time he was crawling on the clinic. And that is the grace of God. Today, my son, or rather three weeks' time, my son is going to get married, right? He will be walking down the aisle, not only seeing his son walking down the walking, but he's walking down the aisle with our daughter-in-law, right? And that is our awesome God. Who can, who can imagine a doctor giving him a death sentence three months and God preserved him, extended his life. It wasn't easy, I must say, 24 years. It was five cancer relapse. It wasn't like a smooth cruise, yeah? Nothing is like a smooth cruise. When you, just like just now the worship leader was singing the song, Refiner's Fire. Is you have to go through the fire to be refined by God, to be changed, to be able to rejoice in suffering. But I'm not saying walking with God is, is a smooth journey. But when God chosen you, even no matter how tough, how suffering the journey is, God will equip you every step of the way. How many pit I have gone through for five cancer relapse and how many times every cancer my husband almost died and wake up. A lot of my mother called my husband a cat's life, you know, like cats got nine life, right? But it is the work of God, the grace of God that give him the extension of life. And we borrowed 24 years. We don't know. You know, after three months, every day is a borrowed day. When you live in that perspective, all the things around you, how your wife, your husband dress, I used to be so picky on my husband. It doesn't matter anymore because you just focus on that one day. Uh, that one day. So sometimes when we walk with God, we never understand why. But now I can look back. The journey we walk through, being idolatry, being a Taoist, being a Buddhist, from Taoist become a, a Buddhist because I, I didn't want to see the master anymore. I told my mom, I don't want to see the master. Then we went in big way in Buddhism. So we practice meditation, we go to India, we go to Thailand, we go to Tibet, we go to Nepal. Everything we try just to find a cure for my husband. Even until today, there's no cure. But only Jesus can cure my husband. All the medical treatment he went through, the body has been bombarded with so many chemicals. But at the end, ultimately, it was God's hand. Even if you use medicine, it must be God's divine hand to come together that sustain life. Because in the scripture, it says, even when you were in your mother's womb, the number of even the number of hairs on your hair, God already predestined every part of our body. The number of days in our life are really dictated by Him. So we walk with Him. He will be the one who will direct our path. But of course, from that doctor pronounced that, then we like, okay, what to do? But fast forward, because there's so many relapse, yeah, it wasn't easy. I wouldn't want to say every pit. If I have seven days conference here, maybe what day one, first pit, second one, <laughs> second pit. But now I fast forward all my first pit, second pit, now because the relapse so many times. It was on the fourth relapse, the cancer went to the brain. And that brain, that tumor, was so big that this time he said, I'm not going to make it. And he just came back from um, India because every year he go to India to, to when we were, before I become a Christian, we go together, we chutsya, we shave the hair, we, we meditate at the Bodhi tree where Buddha was enlightened. 
we travel with the Reverend and we like a pilgrimage trip. And so many years, and we were vegetarian, pusasan, no killing and everything. We follow everything that is possible in human ethnic way. Now that I know God, it's not what we do, what we've done. Nothing will change anything. Even you've done all the wrong thing, it's about what He has done for us. He has died on the cross so that His blood of Jesus and cleanse away all our sin. We can try and try and try. Even I, I knew, uh, 10 years walking in Buddhism way, I tried to reduce my debts. People say karma. Reduce my debts. Pay my debts back by doing good things. How, man, how many good works you want to do, you still reincarnate back to chicken or dog or whatever, right? I say, wow, like that. Uh, how many years we have to do that? Because when I read the Tripitaka, we were very into Buddhism. And Buddha was enlightened out of 476 lives. I said, wow, we cannot do that. So, I mean, there's a journey when you're blinded, you just follow. Because I believe that. Because I never encountered God. I don't know who is God. I never sat in a church. Nobody invited me to church. And also because my mom is very, it's a tiger mom. If you go to church, she would disown me. That kind of thing, right? Because she has a own master, own temple, uh, and all that. So we brought up by that. So we never even think of going to church. So that was the reason why I was so superstitious, so blinded by my idolatry faith. But of course, God is so amazing. Not that we choose to be God's children. God has chosen us, even long time ago. He sees our heart. You, you can call yourself anything. Even for my husband, on the day of the operation when the tumor came into his head, before he was pushed into the operating theater, he's, he was still a Buddhist. He's still meditating in his bed before he go. Then I called my pastor to pray for him to come to the ward. He saw the pastor. He told the pastor, I don't need to pray for me. I know you, my wife asked you to come. You pray for other wards. So other people need your prayer. I don't need your prayer. I don't know who is your God. And you're only a pastor. Pastor is only a secretary to God. I don't speak to secretary. Where do I want, you know? I want direct line with your God. If you want me to believe your God, give me direct line, right? And this is what exactly Jesus up there here, what he said. God always give your desire of your heart. Always. Without you knowing. And that's what happened when he pushed into the operating theater. 25 hours, operation one second come out. Didn't make it. He went into coma. And he was practically multiple organs failure. The brain shut down to 90%. So the doctor called all of us, <clears throat> give me a, <clears throat> a consent form to switch off the life support machine. <clears throat> that was the moment of God become so real. I was a very new Christian then. I truly didn't know how to pray. When you're a new Christian, you don't know how God works until you encounter him in the pit. You think you'll find God when you're happy, joyful, having party. No. I found God when I'm in the darkest pit, the moment when my heart, I cried out my heart to God. It was the moment when I was asked to sign the consent form to switch off my life, my husband's life support machine. And that was the moment and I encountered God the first time. As I kneel down, and because in being a new believer, I don't know how God works, and I just kind of like, your Bible says so, like, you know, like what brother said, your Bible says so. Your Bible, you say you can turn the lame to walk, the blind to see. And then I was looking at my husband's ICU room with so many machines pumping into him, 12 tubes all over him. I say, Lord, he needs to breathe. He doesn't need a life support machine. You are the one who's breathing into him. Why can't you just blow air into his, then he wake up because you're so powerful. Your, your scriptures say you're so powerful. You see, when you test God, when you really ask from your heart out of desperation, God never punished me because I was a bit angry or so. You know, in the desperate moment, <clears throat> you can do all things, right? But God knows your heart. And when I, my father-in-law came to say, don't worry, just sign because we have already had bonus 10 years. That was 2008. The fourth relapse of cancer, 2008. And 10 years bonus, mentally, to be honest, I was ready. But somehow, when I about to sign that form with that pen in my hand, I felt so heavy. 
I couldn't even move. I just break down and cry, say, Lord, you are the one. In the scripture, you say, you are the one who give authority to give life, to take life. Who am I? Even legally in the world, as a wife, we must sign the form for the doctor to switch it off. But I say, I cannot do this. You are the one who decided. Tell me what to do. Every day, my father-in-law comes and say, um, you know, sign. And then the doctor always say, we are not doing anything. But I say, Lord, what do I do? I really cried out my heart to God. And Jeremiah 29, 13 say, right? When you truly cry your heart out to God, He will answer you. And the Lord answered me that same night. He gave me the verse, John 11, 11. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up, said Jesus to Martha. There was a story about the tombstone. That's all. Just one verse. Being a new Christian, I really don't know. To me, I was still a bit of an old Taoist concept, right? We go to temple, chiu qian, chiu qian, you know. So to me, that was, oh, God is speaking to me, you know. So that time, you know, God will make every situation to make sure his message delivered. It doesn't matter, my mind was thinking about qian or what, because that was my old background. When you're trying to transition into a new uh, kingdom of God's work, a lot of old habits still come back. And God will continue, continue, continue to remold and refine you. And that's the journey I've been, right? And um, because of that verse, I say, I'm not going to sign this form. Jesus is going to wake him up. So I waited. And the next day, a pastor from another church came with a CD. And I don't know this pastor. He was just prompted because I was texting all my friends to the church. Please get your church to pray for my husband. He's, uh, he's pronounced dead by doctor. I have to sign the form. This pastor from this church, as he was praying for Tony, the Lord prompted him, bring this CD to Tony. And he came, looking for me, and passed me the CD, and tell me three things I must find. See, the Lord wanted to, to heal, to touch Tony, but something is blocking him, which is a three thing. The ashes, the, tel- the yellow paper with red writing, which is, I have a lot left over, which didn't work that time. And then the last thing was the, um, the triangular thing. And that time, I was already Christian. We already migrated to Melbourne. The minute he was given three months, the first thing we do is we uproot, go to Australia, and just enjoy our three months. But of course, at that time, I didn't know we can borrow 24 years until today, right? So, and um, that is something that the three things, when we migrated to Australia, my, all my praying thing I just put in my mother's house because my mother's house is like a temple. So I just move everything to my... And that time when I moved to Australia, I was still a Buddhist or, or yeah, a Buddhist. So because of this encounter 2008, when the pastor wanted me to destroy all the three things, I haven't got memory what are those three things. I know we collected a lot of things, Hmong ashes, whatever they, they say good, we just collect back and then we just, you know... But um, God is amazing. God will prompt you what to do when certain path of your way, you have obstacle. And he will send pastor from not even my church, somewhere that I even don't know. And God will use angel this way, then you know God is at work. So he passed me the CD, and then straight away I played the CD. Within five minutes, in the ICU room, I was started whipping, it's like, I just broke down and cry. I, the CD is just a breath of God, a collection of psalms. It's not music. It's word of God. Word of God from the Bible. Then as I would start crying, and then I saw for the first time my husband's tears running nonstop like rivers flows at that instant. And I knew God has touched him. And I believe that was a moment when he shared. He saw God. I think that was the encountering moment. We cannot decide, don't know which is fifth day, sixth day or whatever, but he woke up on the seventh day. He woke up on the seventh day, he was paralyzed from neck down. And from neck down, that day when he woke up, he said, I saw your God, Jesus. I cry and cry and cry. And I knew God is doing work in his life, and, but he was paralyzed. 
So I, but I was very happy when he woke up. I was just so happy I, because God told me He will restore him whole. But I don't know it would take how long. Yeah. So before I invite my husband to come up to speak his encountering with God, yeah, I just want to really, really thank you God for His amazing love. Even when my husband, not a believer, chasing his past, chasing the pastor out of a ward. And our Lord is so merciful that even at his point of death, God gave me this Ezekiel 37, 12, saying that that was a moment when fourth, fifth, sixth day, nothing happened, right? So I say, Lord, are you sure you're going to wake him up? And that night, God gave me another scripture, the Ezekiel 37, um, um, uh, 37, 12. Yeah? I just want to... Because it's so, um, it's so powerful. This, this is the one that really grounded me back. Because when you are pushed by what in the world you see with human eyes, a lot of doubts can come in. Enemy will, will try to kind of sway you out, not trusting God. How can you trust God? Wake up. See, no, nothing, right? And when God gave me that scripture, Ezekiel 37, 12, I'd like to share this with you. Because this is a very powerful message that really grounded me in the Lord. Therefore, prophecy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your grave and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your grave and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land, then you know that I am the Lord that has spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. So when I read this, and I know God is going to stretch out his hand, open the grave, and pull him out from the grave. Not only that, pull him out on the grave to live, but to live in his spirit. And today I want to invite my husband, Tony, to come up to share his direct line with God because it is in his spirit that he's walking, talking, running. All, all praise, applause to God. Thank you. Thank you, church. As uh, you have heard, uh, today I'm going to talk to you all not about me. It's not about me, the story. It's not about even my wife. I'm going to talk to you about a God called Jesus, the living God. It's all about Him. We are just instrument. For whatever reason, He decides who He wants to use. I mean, He can use a donkey if He wants. But He is the living God. He decides who he wants so that his words will come to you. It is his love for you that we are here so that you'll be encouraged by him through us just as an instrument to bring his love and his care for you all. And I learn now as a Christian Walking with God, he always listened to prayer. And his language is prayer. It doesn't matter to him what you speak, Cantonese, Indian, Tamil, anything. He understands the language of prayer. So let's come to him and speak to him. Lord God, I thank you, Lord, that you allow us to come here to this church. Although it may take six years, seven years, but you know, Lord, what each and individual here require and need from you. It's by your love, Lord, you allow us to come here to encourage them to know 
You are the only true living God. They need in their life so that they will know you are the one that bless. You are the one that gives life. Life ever after. Lord, I pray that your spirit be among us this morning. Let the Holy Spirit come so that every heart here be touched by you. Open the eyes of their heart so that they can see for themselves a personal relationship for themselves with you, Lord. So then they will know, Lord, that you are the living God that have personal, individual relationship with one another, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will lead me Anoint my lips so that words that will come from you through the Holy Spirit to touch every heart here, since that you have chosen this church for us to speak about you. I pray all this, Lord God, in Jesus' name, Amen. So I'll cut everything short. Uh, in a sense that uh, whatever my wife said, I just uh, come straight into it. As uh, she said, you know, I mean, imagine she's a silver engineer. She's a, 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 a professional, you know, with a master degree. A woman like that can send the husband up to the rooftop to be struck by lightning. Of course, uh, many pastors ask, how come you dare to do it? Hey, I said, are you married or not? I asked the pastor. If you're married, then you understand. Between the lightning strike and the chopper, which one you want? <laughs> so, okay, I'm, then I go straight to, uh, in the hospital, you know, after operating. They actually drill a hole in my head, the skull. They took out part of the bone. Because my cancer grew inside my brain, the size of an orange, that size, inside, the, not outside. So for the doctor, the only way is to cut that cancer out, which is, you have to cut your brain also. Okay? And when they cut me, I come out as a person like a vegetative stage, like a, in Cantonese, so it's, it's like a, a person that cannot move anymore. Coma, I mean coma. So they connect me with 12 tubes. One tube in the brain going to a machine and 12 other tubes in the lungs, in the kidney, in the liver, every part, you know, 12 tubes into a machine so that they can monitor whether this guy after operation is still alive or not. So I, they left me there and then on the fourth day, as my wife said, they call my father in and they call my wife in and a number of relatives to come in. He said, I have very bad news. So four surgeons, not one, said, I have very bad news for you told my father, your son, the brain connected to a machine. This machine never lied to any doctor. We always rely on this machine. And we have cut thousands of brain. Your son is not, not the first brain. And the machine say, your son, the brain already shut down. 99% already dead. The brain is dead. So, my advice, this is the bad news, you can collect the body. Not even come and say goodbye to your son. Collect the body. Because uh, as doctor, we can confirm he is already dead. So, my father do uh, get, try to get the coffin, you know. And, of course, our living God never allowed me to use this coffin. And, after that, uh, they waited for my wife because under the law, the wife had to sign a form for them to switch off everything. 
switch off the machine, switch off uh, all the connection. So the four doctor wait there at the ICU, look at my wife, when she walk in, she say, so have you signed? Asked my wife. My wife came in and told the four doctors, I am not going to sign this form. My God is going to wake him up. So I want you to imagine you are a specialist, a doctor who know everything about science. So they talk to each other. They say, oh, very simple. We are dealing with a cuckoo. Because this woman is cuckoo. How can when the brain already shut off, the lungs, kidney, everything working already because the brain not connected, no more function. And she said, her God is going to wake her up. Wake this man. So, they tell my wife and uh, the relative there, I can tell you, and God allowed this because four doctors, not one. Every doctor say the same thing. No more hope. Meaning, we're not going to do anything because you're wasting our time. When we say a person is dead, he medically already dead. The brain also not working. So he just left me there in the ICU because the, sign, the form is not signed by my wife. They cannot put me in a mortuary. Mortuary means for dead people, ice room for dead body. So they put me at the ICU, just do nothing. They left me there after the fourth day. So I believe since they announced me dead on the fourth day, I have this vision on the fifth day. On the fifth day, the first thing I saw in this vision is myself. I can tell you it is a shock to you when you can see yourself not in a mirror, in an ICU bed. So when I saw, I said, why am I looking at myself? Then a strong voice on the right came to my right ear. It says, look up. Just two words, look up. Today, I believe that's the Holy Spirit telling me what to do because of the Lord. He said, look up. So I immediately look up. Angeline, can you give them the first uh, picture to show them? Now, I cannot produce to all of you what the Lord showed me when I was confirmed dead. But I want to give you a taste of what he showed me so that you'll be encouraged by this living God. How powerful is this God that you serve? So when I look up, this is what I saw in the sky. A bright looking sun coming down towards me. So I said, how come the sun can move? Can continue coming down, you know? As it continue coming down, I can see even the clouds are scared of him, you know? The clouds will turn left and right and leave a gap for this sun to continue coming down. As I look up at the sun, then I realize it's not just an ordinary sun. The sun that I saw start changing shape, change to a, like a being, like a person, standing up very bright with the left and right hand open up. And this is picture two, Thank you, Angeline. This is what I saw. The sun that I thought is a sun is actually a God, which I didn't know. It actually spreads out his hand and continue coming down. As it continue coming down, this is what I see. So today, as a Christian, I can tell you the God that you all serve is pure light. You go to the Bible, go to 1 John 1, 5. Jesus himself tell us, I am light. There is no darkness in me at all. Our God that we serve is just pure light. Why? I don't know. All I know is the God that we serve is light. So this is what I saw. As it continued coming down in this form, I already know it is not human. It is definitely God. Because human 
cannot be with a shining like a sun. And it continued coming down and then stood on my right, right side. So I, in my vision, I said to myself, this must be a very shy God. I really know it has to be God. No one can become like that. So I said, shy God, don't want to see me face to face. And I didn't realize, now today I'm a Christian knowing the Bible. God in the Bible make it very clear to all verse. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 20, God himself said, you, anyone, cannot look at me directly. So I didn't know that this God doesn't want me to see and die. Why? Of course, you can ask, why like that? Why cannot? Because God that we serve is called holy, holy, holy. Three times holy. That's how holy our God is. And we on earth, we are sinner. So we are sinning, sinner, sinner. Three times sinning. Or uh, even more. And we didn't realize we cannot look at a holiness beyond our understanding because we just cannot appear in front of a holy God like that. And He knows. And I believe He doesn't want me, one, to be struck by lightning, two, to die in this ICU room because I see Him directly. So He stood on the right. I can see the brightness on my right. You know? Because it's so bright, I have to see that brightness with uh, my hand on top of my eyes like that. Of course, today I realize we can't see God directly like that because of His holiness beyond our understanding. But still on the right, I hear this. Again, I cannot produce for you the voice of Jesus. But I'm going to give you just a small sample, a taste of what I heard when I was confirmed dead. Now, still on the right, I hear this. Tony! Bam! 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 Exactly like thunder. Very loud and frightening. But yet, it's something I cannot explain to you. That powerful, fearful voice has an element of love. Can you imagine? He called me with this thunder and I felt love. How can you understand this God that He can call you with such a fearful, thundery voice and yet there is love in it? One explanation is this. You imagine your father, your own father, is scolding you for whatever wrong you're doing. By scolding you with love, your father scolds you because he loves you to correct you. So this voice has said, first word, do not palm, palm, palm. Be afraid. Just by that first word, do not be afraid with the thunder, I was very afraid. Because, you know, I never heard a voice so powerful, so thundering. And even if you go to the Bible, you realize even the Israeli people, when they were under the Mount Sinai, when God spoke to them, they were so fearful. Then now I understand as a Christian, why were they so fearful? They even tell Moses, don't tell God to talk to us anymore. That is because of that God powerful voice. This is our God. And then after that word, do not be afraid. I got a second word. Again from the right. Tony Pam Pam Pam. Remember this. 
for the rest of your life. Bam, bam. I will walk in front of you for the rest of your life. Bam, bam. That's all. God don't waste time with you because he know exactly what you need. And that's these two words. Do not be afraid because he knows that I'm very afraid. And then second word, I walk in front of you. And again, as a Christian now that I know the Bible, God say, I walk in front of you is in chapter Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 2. So God can walk in front of us if he wants. So now I learn as a Christian, what do you mean that God walk in front of you? It actually means we follow him. We cannot be in front of him. He is God. You walk following him behind. Means we become Christian, disciple, following a God called Jesus. And after that second word, which is walking in front of you, just two words. God, don't waste time. And he knows exactly what I need in my life. Just do not be afraid and that I follow him as he walk in front of me. Just a second word, I wake up seven days later. Of course, the four doctors who confirmed me dead, they rushed to the ICU thinking that maybe something is wrong. Maybe it's not real, you know. And they said, ghost. There's no ghost. And they brought machine to test my lungs, Text a kidney and they shout at each other because I'm awake, I can hear them. They say, Dr. John, the lungs is working 100%. So to them, they themselves are afraid, you know. How come like that? You know? And this is our God. Maybe to wake them up, you know, that they are not the one to decide your life. God decides your life. Then after checking then the last surgeon which is a brain surgeon this brain surgeon is a number one doctor brain surgeon that operate brain in malaysia and in singapore so he came in he said tony i normally don't talk to patient but since you are dead and you came back i need to talk to you so he said uh, i got very good news for you but I also got very bad news for you. The good news is four of us, one, two, three, four, including me, say you are dead. But you wake up. So very good news for you. But I am a top brain surgeon here in this country. I know everything about brain. And that is the bad news for you. The bad news is this. When I cut you, I took out one quarter of your brain. So I know without this brain, from neck down, you are paralytic. Paralytic means paralyzed, total paralyzed. Your hand cannot use, your leg cannot use. Because this part of the brain taken out also affected the nerve connected to your hand and leg. So how are you going to move? No nerve, no wire. So after that, then he left. And every doctor I met told me, this doctor, you don't waste your time. He only know medicine and he only know how to cut brain. Don't talk to him about God. He will never believe. You know? And my wife came in. The first thing she did, because it's true enough what the doctor said. I woke up as a paralyzed man. It means a person that cannot use his body. From neck down, my eyes can move, my mouth can move a bit, but the doctor say, even when you speak, people cannot understand because your brain not connected. You speak with a sir. Surging means uh, like that. So this God knows, I cannot speak like that. Uh, how you going to understand? So he makes sure I can speak. Today, so that I can stand here to talk to you all about him, not about me. 
then that you believe He is the living God that can do everything. So, as after that, um, my wife, first thing she did was buy me a pampers. Hey, at that time, I'm 50 years old. In Chinese, mm sap soya. Have to wear pampers. How embarrassing, isn't it? Because I'm paralyzed, cannot go to the toilet. So, I tell you, it's the biggest pampers i ever seen. Wrapped around me. Yeah. So, they took me back to my condo. I was living in a condo in Kuala Lumpur. So the first thing I asked the pastor, hey, pastor, because I become very hungry after what I encounter and in my vision and seeing the light, you know. So I asked the pastor, hey, how to know your God? He said, uh, to know this God, you must know the Bible. You know the Bible, you know this God. So that's how important the words of God are. Every word that is in the Bible come from Him. He is the one who is the author of the Bible. So when you read the Bible, you must remember you have the privilege to read the mind, the mind of God is inside the Bible when you read. So I'm in a wheelchair. You must imagine now I cannot walk. I cannot use hand, cannot use leg. Paralyzed man. So, in a wheelchair, in a condo, I started reading the Bible. So, the Bible is in front. The wheelchair has a, like a platform like this. The Bible is put in front. So, every pastor I met, because I, I share in many churches in four countries, not just one country. So, the the pastor always asks the same question. Tony, your hand cannot move. Bible put in front of your wheelchair. How to turn the Bible? I say, ah, then you get to come to know this God. A God with a sense of humor. So I pray, in, in, you must imagine yourself, I, I'm not hoping that you are in a wheelchair, okay, but since you are sitting down, Imagine you are in a wheelchair, your Bible in front. How to turn? Hand cannot move. So I pray. That's how I learned how powerful prayer is. I say, Lord God, everyone I ask, your people, I don't even know how to say pastor, I say your people, say I must understand your words in this Bible. Nothing happened. The hand cannot move, so how to turn the Bible, even after first prayer. So God expects you to be very patient. And He does test you. No matter what, He does test you. So I ask for second prayer. Lord, I really want to know you. And every pastor, everyone said that we must understand your words. Again, still don't move. The hand cannot move. Nothing. So cannot read the Bible. So the third time I pray, I say, Lord, no matter what, Lord, you, since you have shown me your vision, your cell, your powerful cell, and your incredible voice, let me know you, Lord, so that I can go out there and tell them that you are the one true, powerful, living God. That all will come to believe you are the living God. And just the third prayer, nothing move again in a wheelchair, but God have a sense of humor. This thing move. Only this one move, nothing else move. God, God knows if Tony can walk and can move, he won't read my Bible. Sitting in a wheelchair. God, I spent like how many months in the hospital? You know? The last thing I want to do is sit down and then read Bible. I run to all the shopping center to enjoy myself. Because stuck for so long, just like COVID, you know. Locked up for so many months. So he knows. Tony don't need anything except this. So only this thing can move. So with the Bible in front, 
I start with page one, can turn. But because you must imagine, you are inside a wheelchair and you are wearing pampers. Don't even need to go to the toilet. So 24-7 only read the Bible. So I am so hungry, I finished the Bible. You know? Immediately I finished the Bible, I want you all to imagine you are sitting now in a wheelchair. This is not my hope, but I'm just asking you to imagine. You are sitting in a wheelchair like me in a wheelchair. And when I close the Bible, Revelation, last chapter, and I see, God wants me to see. Other people cannot see, but I can see. In a wheelchair, my left leg and right leg got fire coming out. I, I then in my mind, oh, I'm on fire. So I want you to imagine you are sitting down now, got fire on your leg. What do you do? I jump up. Oh. So I jump up. Then I look left and right. Hey, doctor said cannot, cannot walk. Oh. How come I jump up? I thought I'm having a, a vision, not real one. You know? How can I'm standing up? You know. Then I thought to myself, if I can stand up like that. Imagine still wearing the pampers. Huh? And I started trying to walk. Exactly like a baby walking. Well, you forget to walk. After, after months, you forget how to walk. Huh? The muscle on got cold already. But I walk every step, exactly like a baby. My wife, the weakness, seeing the, me starting to walk. You know? No therapy, nothing. All this from God. And as I start walking, after a few days, can walk properly already. Another few days, can run in the, in the field. Another, another few weeks, do ballroom dancing with my wife. So, you know, this doctor who doesn't believe in God, under the brain surgery is very serious, so I have to go for a checkup. Six months later, I have to go into his clinic, very big clinic. You know. And I went there, he, he go into his clinic, he looked at me, he said, Hey, young man, can you wait outside? I got somebody in wheelchair coming. Appointment is for that man, not for you. So I went back to the nurse, the nurse Mary, I remember her name. Sorry, Pastor Mary, different Mary, yeah. So I, I said, Mary, uh, what happened to my appointment? Then she looked at my appointment and said, yes, it's for you. Then she brought me personally, you know, to the clinic and told the doctor, doctor, this is your appointment. The doctor looked at me. First question he asked me, what happened to your wheelchair? I said, doctor, you cut my brain, you took out my brain, my, you don't know I'm Tony. Cannot be. How can you be Tony? What happened? Wheelchair. So he said, I, I don't believe you. You come in. I want to see. So the clinic is very big. So he wants me to walk. I want to see you walk. So I walk. Every step I walk, you can see the ice getting bigger and bigger. And the jawbone coming down. down. When I reach the end, the jaw dropped on the floor. <laughs> he said, hey, hey, you, you, you from which planet? I said, doctor. If I tell you what happened to me, you got no time to check on me. So long. Say, oh, oh, oh can, can, cannot be, cannot be. What happened? Then I asked the doctor, so doctor, today what is the checking for? He said, uh, go home. Go home. Because for him, he don't know what to do already. He said, go, go home. Go home. You see how powerful this God is? Two years later, he became a Christian. And I can confirm it's a real story. This doctor is also baptized already. So he became a believer. All his friends, all his doctor friends say, wow, this fellow, what happened to him? You know? So God can even use your brain to change a person. I never even talked to him. I, I don't think I have enough time anymore, right? Okay, I'm going to uh, 
bring my wife up to do a, a song for you all, a very special song. This song comes from Jesus that will give you healing and to give you calmness, peace in your heart. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. I married this husband because he's very funny. I fall in love with him, he's very funny. But through our journey, I, I'm really thankful to God. Even walking with him, a lot of tears, buckets of tears. But he, even coming out from the operating theater, he still makes me laugh. That's my husband. And every time I have to change a pampers, he always makes a joke out of everything, right? So, but God is good, as you can see. But that was a fourth relapse, yeah? And of course, we didn't have chance to share about fifth relapse. After that, we share our God's testimony like here, go everywhere. But 2015, 216, the cancer came back. That's another pit. Remember, I was telling you we have many pits we have to go through, yeah? And it is true, the little, little pits, each one, God refined us, every pit. Because when you drop down in the darkest pit, that's where God showed up. God is not going to show up when our life is at ease and comfort because we don't have time for God. We always, human is human. God knows us. That's why we are born as sinners. But God is so merciful. He always waits for the right time. When you're in, in the darkest moment, He's always there for you. You just have to cry your heart out to Him and He's always there. Even for us, walking this journey of cancer, now that we reflect back, it's, it's easy to say. But at that time, every time when the, the cancer come back, I was a bit disappointed, especially the fifth relapse after my husband become a Christian. When the cancer come back, and I just told the Lord, why? Why does this cancer have to come back again, even after he knows you? You know, the Lord gave me this scripture, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, that remember the Paul asked the Lord to take the thorn in his flesh away. Three times Paul asked the Lord to take it away. But three times the Lord tell Paul the same thing. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will more want to too. This, this flesh is, is really sent to torment us. This cancer was really sent to torment us. But God turned into a blessing. If God asks us again, say, if I give you a choice to walk the life, do you want to walk the life and going through what you've gone through with Tony, seeing going through cancer? And I still will say yes, because it was through the cancer we found God. Without cancer, I think I'm still living in a very worldly world, having party, getting myself drunk, partying all the time. So today, I, I must rejoice. Rejoice with all the suffering. As one of the verses also God in the Bible said, Roman 5, 3, 5. Rejoices in all suffering because only through suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character and character hope. And today the hope does not put us into... Um, I can't read my... Hold on up. <laughs> yeah. Produces a hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love have been poured out into our heart through the Holy Spirit. It is always through our suffering, our heart are ready to open for God. And it is through this suffering journey that um, we walk and God used the fire to, remote, to, to refine us. It wasn't an easy journey, but this song that God gave me, it is a song that I really walk away from God during that time. And I believe some, now that as I was sharing how, why I dropped out 2019 to 2022 that time was my moment of the most um, deepest, darkest beat. That was when my husband has a fifth relapse. And when church is still calling us to share, I don't know how to share anymore. How can we stand in the pulpit and say, it's so easy to share God's miracle up to the fourth stage, right? When you hear, but when you fifth, when the cancer come back, how do I face you? I say, God is a God of miracle, but my husband has cancer again. I couldn't do it. 
I just couldn't do it. I was hiding for a while. Now, as I was sitting, I say, how do I drop out of that conversation with Pastor Clement? And the Lord said, because you were angry with me. You were hiding from me. And, and it's true, I confess. I didn't want to pray. I didn't want to read the Bible for almost one year. And that was my moment. I said, Lord, I'm not going to speak for you. I'm not going to bless your name because the cancer come back. How am I going to glorify you? And that is the same time my younger brother, Jackman, passed, have brain cancer and passed on. And that was my moment. It's like double pit. You go into double pit, you say, don't even lift me up. I don't want to go to mountain top. Right? And we all go through that. And that was time God gave me this song. He said, I know you're going through storms of life. Storms after storms. I say, I have enough. I don't want the storms anymore. And God sang this song to me on the flight. And in 45 minutes flight from Singapore to KL, the Lord sang this song in Mandarin. He gave me all the words in this song. So I composed this song, not because I composed it. God gave me the words. And somebody had the song from my cancer support group with the, the music too. So the Lord say, I have taught you to dance with the storm. Don't fight your storm. When I'm with you, you flow by the storm, ride with the waves. That's where you dance with the storm. Don't fight with it. Because God didn't, you don't need to use your energy. I was trying to use my own strength to try to find solution and everything. But God remind me, when you have Him in your life, he will fight all the storms for you. You just dance with the storm. You don't have to fight the storm. So I want to finish off with this song. And I pray that this song will heal whatever situation you're in. And this is a very special song God gave me. And he actually tell me that it is a song of healing. And I pray that this song will anoint and put into your heart as I sing. And, and you will talk to the Lord. And the restoration will take place whatever situation you are in. And this is the title of a song called Dancing in the Storm. Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful song. Invite your presence to come to touch the lives of many here today. Worship, <laughs> 却走不出最远长的路你是我的力量你是我的高堂都在你的翅膀下飞舞你是我的救助你是我的前排我要永远永远的赞美
要永远、永远地赞美你。是你的光亮照耀我的路，是你的慈爱拥抱我，是你的宝血洗净我的罪。Thanks to you for all the good things you have done, even for those things that thorn in the flesh, the cancer, which is a curse by the enemy. But Lord, you turn into a blessing into our lives. Without the cancer, how do we know you? I just want to give thanks to you, Lord. Even today, you have brought so many people come here to hear your story, because I know each one of us are walk through different journey. But yet, Lord, I know, as long as we have You walking in front of us, no matter how hard the journey is, Lord, You will be the one who bring us out of the pit, just like how You brought us out from one pit after another, and just like how You bring calm the storm by just one word, and the storm will be still. But Lord, today I just pray that everyone today here. We'll be touched by your story. We'll be touched by your anointing. We'll be touched by your Holy Spirit to want to accept you as the Lord and Savior for those who still do not know you. I pray that they will not be like us to have to wait for so long to get to know you, to accept you as the Lord and Savior. I also want to pray that for those who are already a believer, renew their walks with you. Let them see you. Let them draw close to you in every situation of their life, and I just want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for this amazing, amazing story that you've written in our life, that we can walk and really carry this gospel for you to share your testimony everywhere we go, to shine the light, to hold out the beacon, to shine the light for you, to bless your name. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Thank you. All applause to our dear Lord Jesus. Thank you.